let's go straight into the reading because um, we're finishing off in the book of James. And uh, I always prefer to have my own Bible, you know. It's, it's okay having that one, but I prefer my own. You know what it's like, you get used to something, don't you? And you just like to have it by your side, especially when it's your Bible. Um, so James 5, last chapter of James. And uh, it's a short book, but gosh, isn't it challenging? The way James has um, just laid down so practically and actually quite forcefully what he wants to tell us. He doesn't beat around the bush. He's quite direct. And this last section of James is about prayer and faith. He says from verse 13... come up on the screens if you haven't got got it in front of you is any one of you in trouble he should pray is anyone happy let him sing songs of praise is any one of you sick he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is, if, if nothing else, it's a great encouragement to bring people to the Lord. You cover over a multitude of sins. That's always encouraged me, you know. I know that I'm a sinful person, and there's a lot about me that needs improvement. And... Uh, and this gives me hope. <laughs> when you bring people to the Lord, there's a lot of forgiveness in that. Hallelujah. God is good and uh, his love endures forever. And we read that and it was in Psalm 100 today, which is one of my favourite psalms. Out of the 150, Psalm 100 is one of my favourites. Um, Shout to the Lord all the earth. A real renouncing, uh, uh, encouraging, I should say, uh, psalm. James 5 tells us that we have a privilege of prayer. An absolute privilege. If there was one kind of like dream, uh, dream focus for this sermon, it's that we have a privilege of prayer. Because prayer is a wonderful thing. Through prayer, we see marvellous miracles. People getting healed. People getting set free from addictions. People being released from the chains of debt. We see absolute miracles. We also see ecstatic encounters where people meet with God. In prayer, people meet with God in such a way that cannot be, be replicated. It's a wonderful thing. But there are also some peculiar kinds of prayers. Prayers that you don't normally expect. <coughs> Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but I asked for a puppy. 
dear God, please send me a pony. I've never asked for anything. You can look it up. <laughs> dear God, if you give me a genie, I'll give you anything you want. <laughs> and one that touches me is, dear God, why is Sunday school on Sunday when it's supposed to be a day of rest? I can remember that when I went to the Methodist church just around the corner from us. I couldn't work out why it was so much hard work going to church and I've had to endure school all week and then I get it again on Sunday. And if you're dyslexic, it's not the kind of thing that you want to do. And it's, I was pretty disruptive during that. So that's another thing I need forgiveness for, no doubt. But prayer is powerful. And God hears our prayers. And we are righteous in Christ. This week I've been deeply moved in a number of ways. But one of the ways is through Ephesians 3, verses 10 to 11. And it came up during one of our prayer meetings um, on the Thursday morning. And in verses 10 to 11 it says, his intent, this is God's intent, was that now through the church, you and me, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is God's intent that through you and me, his wisdom is made known to everything. Creation that we know of and all the things that we don't know of in the heavenly realms. He has chosen you and me in his manifold wisdom. And I looked up that word manifold and it's a strange word because you get it in car engines, the manifold. And I thought, well, what? Of, you know, what type of wisdom is that? And then when we ask Google, of course, Google tells us everything, right? Kind of. Google said that it's a part of the engine there where things go into it and things come out of it. And manifold means kind of like how things are collected into one place and uh, delivered out of that place. God's manifold wisdom is his top highest wisdom where everything is considered in, into it. And in God's wisdom where he has considered everything, he has chosen you and me as part of the church to display his grace and glory. Isn't that incredible? How he would choose you and me to do that for everything in the world and all the authorities and powers in the heavenly realms. That's his purpose. And how do we do that? We've got to pray. It's through our prayers as we pray to him that his glory is revealed. It's in prayer that we see this revelation, the manifold wisdom of God, put into action when we pray for revival, when we pray for healing, when we pray for deep change in our lives. You and I are faced with the reality of this passage. You know, people believe in prayer. They might say, oh yeah, yeah, I pray but they don't actually experience the power of it. We nod our heads and agree that it's possible. Prayer can work. And we agree with each other. But we seldom make the effort to come to prayer meetings unless it's convenient. And this is the challenge for us today here, in a way. You know, if... If it's at the wrong time, oh, I'm not coming to that. It's far too early for me. Or it's far too late for me. Or it's on the wrong day. Oh, you know, I've got something else I do on that day normally. 
I normally go singing or I normally go dancing or I normally go fishing or I normally go whatever it is. The prayer meeting isn't convenient, so I don't go. We don't understand the privilege that God has given us in prayer. If we really understood that, we wouldn't care how inconvenient the prayer meeting was. We would be there. The last prayer meeting, the last men's prayer meeting that happened here, not one person turned up. It's a, it's a tragedy for us men. We haven't taken this responsibility that God has given us seriously. He has chosen you and me to display his manifold wisdom to the world and we can't even be bothered to turn up. We pray only when the, ex the circumstances are extreme. When there's particular distress, then we might turn up to the meetings. And in the meantime, while well, we pray about praying and we offer meetings that people might come and then we talk about the meetings and we talk about the prayers and then perhaps we do some reading and we read some prayer books and, but we never actually get around to praying. You know, you can go to a prayer meeting and chat about stuff for 55 minutes and pray in the last five. How many prayer meetings have you been to like that? I can't count how many. I can't count how many prayer meetings we've had. And we don't, don't even, when we're desperate sometimes, we don't even pray and turn to the Lord. Prayer is captivating in the way it precedes all things. All things that have been good in my life have been preceded with prayer. Everything. I wouldn't have become a Christian if somebody hadn't prayed for me beforehand. I wouldn't have met Jackie if people weren't praying for me beforehand. I wouldn't have come here if people weren't praying beforehand. Nothing that is good that has happened in my life has been without prayer in it. The best things have been preceded by prayer. The best things. James Duncan, a famous minister, said that his preaching was powerful because he would spend 13 hours of prayer before he delivered a sermon. And when Charles Spurgeon was asked why his sermons were so powerful, he said it's because he did a lot of knee work and then he did a lot of knee work. Livingston Shots, on two occasions, was at meetings where 500 people got converted in both meetings. And when he looked back on it, the reason that he put that down to is because the preceding night, he spent all night in prayer. You want something big to happen in your life? And then you spend five minutes in prayer. How humble are we before God when we just pray for five minutes? How humble really are we before God when we don't even turn up to prayer meetings that are arranged for us? And I'm not just saying this to you, I'm deeply affected by this myself as well. Charles Finney, uh, a wonderful evangelist, if you ever get a chance, you read his biography, it's stunning, the effect that he had, especially in the, in the Americas. He would spend one day in the woods fasting and praying. And, and when he did, the effect that that had fasting and praying um, when he would go to a meeting everyone 
apart from one person perhaps, would be on the floor encountering God, humbling themselves, bowing before the presence of God. We want to know the power of prayer, don't we? And sometimes we say, well, it's the least that we can do, when in reality, it's the most that we can do. You can't do any better than to pray. It's the most important thing for us to do. Because prayer gives the power to change. Prayer changes circumstances. It changes people. It's changed me. Prayer can heal us. It has the power to convict us of our sin and release us from any bondage. It has the power to tear down strongholds of evil and raise up towers of peace. Prayer has the power to release the gospel. And in James 5.16 that we have just read, it has two emphases. The first one is the prayer to be fervent. And the second one is the prayer of the righteous prayer. A fervent prayer is a prayer full of faith. And when a prayer is full of faith, then God can use it. And he uses it to build things up. When we don't pray in faith, it's as though we're hindering the work of God. People will say, well, God can do things without my prayers. Yeah, he could, but he chooses to do things with your prayers. In Mark 6, we read that Jesus wondered at their disbelief. He could do, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of of faith. If people don't believe, of course they have no faith. And if they don't have any faith, well then they're not going to pray. But if you do have faith, the expectation is there that you pray. And pray hard as well. There was a widow in Zarephath, a famous story from the prophet Elijah, the same Elijah that we've just read about in James. And this prophet, who uh, was a mighty prophet in God's name, was told to go to Zarephath, and the widow there was told to look after him, and she had a jar of oil that never ran dry and a bowl of flour that never ran dry so they could um, produce bread. And she had to look after her son and uh, Elijah as well at the same time. And the son died. And Elijah prayed over the son, um, laid on his body three times. And um, I guess it's some type of original CPR, I don't know, and, and prayer. And the boy lived. And the widow said, after that, now I know that you are a man of God because the boy's life returned to him. Elijah's prayer was so powerful before God that it brought the boy back to life. Prayer is possible that can do that. The New Testament is littered with powerful prayers, absolutely littered throughout it. In the book of Acts, If you read that, you will see powerful prayer one after another. Pentecost in Acts 2. The lame man who was at the temple gate who was healed in Acts 3. Dorcas who was raised from the dead in Acts 9. Peter was delivered from prison in Acts 12. And the commissioning of Paul in Acts 13, and on and on and on. Mighty, mighty works of God through prayer. We look at our society 
and we wonder how has it got into this state? How come people are stabbing each other so often? There is so much crime. There are many historical examples of the power of prayer. Many. Where there's been revival. The Welsh revival is perhaps the most famous for us. Happened in 1904. There's going to be a picture of Evan Roberts come up on the screen in a moment. When he was aged 13, he started to pray. And God put it on his heart and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And as he got older, that just intensified and intensified. And he would be woken up in the middle of the night by God to pray. And there was a particular three months of really, really intensive prayer that Evan had to go through. And I guess it, he wanted to go through. It was his privilege. And then he went to a meeting three months after the intensive time in the September 1904. It was a, a, a meeting that was called a revival meeting, hoping for revival. And the minister there, Seth Joshua, prayed, bend us, O Lord. And Evan heard the Holy Spirit say to him, this is what you need. So he went away and he prayed more. Lord, bend me. Bend me, bend me, bend me. And the very next service he went to, he went there and he prayed and he prayed so hard that tears were running down his face. And that very day, the revival in Wales started and it swept like a wave across Wales. Within three months, uh, sorry, nine months, a hundred thousand people gave their lives to the Lord. 100,000. That's the population of Eastbourne. Just think of the whole of Eastbourne suddenly becoming born again. Huge revival. And he seldom preached. Occasionally he did. His ministry was really a prayer ministry. Other people would preach. He was asked to go all over the world and he, eventually he burnt out and, interestingly enough, ended up living in Brighton, of all places, right? Just over the way there. But that revival impacted not just Wales, but the whole world, because it spread out. And the Toronto blessing had links to the Welsh revival as well. And the effect it had was not just on the people in the churches, but also in the communities and in the society. The pubs closed because people didn't want to even chance the possibility of something being sinful in their lives. So they stopped going to the pubs. They stopped gambling. The gambling betting offices closed. They stopped going to the theatre. So the theatres closed. The production of the coal mines went down because the donkeys that worked in the coal mines with the miners could no longer understand the language that the miners were using because they stopped swearing. And the donkeys didn't know what the commands were anymore. So they stopped doing the work and the production in the coal mines fell. It affected everything around them. Everything. They worshipped together, they prayed together. Another similar example is this next lady, Pandita, an Indian lady. She was converted from Hinduism in 1891. She was a social reformer. She was one of the first ladies in India, really, to um, become educated. And she did some great work. She raised um, schools for widows and orphans. And she travelled the world trying to get sponsorship. And she went to the Keswick Convention, that famous convention that happens every year in Keswick. 
And she asked 4,000 people while she was there to pray for her, and they did. And it changed her. She was already a Christian, but those prayers changed her, and her prayer life changed. And she started fasting and praying, and fasting and praying more and more and more. And she held special prayer meetings when she got back home, uh, where in two months, 1,200 people got converted. But that was just the start. Because then she heard of the Welsh revival that was going on in 1904 and she organised prayer meetings. At first, there were just 70 people turned up to those. And then, within a very short amount of time, 500 people turned up to those prayer meetings twice a day. And in 1905, the revival truly spread around India. And they were, they were heard to be praying. And people said it was like rolling thunder when their prayers were heard. One other prayer, me um, prayer meeting revival, the next picture will come up now, was in Lewis. Not Lewis here, but Lewis in uh, the Shetland Islands. There's a little island up there called Lewis. Those two old ladies there, sisters, and the one on the right, I think, was the one that was blind. They were in their 80s, these two old ladies. So whenever you think you're getting past it, don't. Because those two were in their 80s and they were burdened with the coldness of people's spirit in Lewis. And they started praying and they started praying and praying about it. And one night, one of them had a vision and they went to their pastor, their minister, and the minister said to them, okay, God has given you this. This is what you need to do. You need to pray seriously now. So they did. They started praying more and more seriously. Two nights a week for four or five hours each time. Three months later, see this didn't happen overnight, three months later, one of the deacons of their church read Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not trust an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Saviour. The deacon prayed and his prayer was, Lord, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? And as he prayed that, the power of the Lord was released on that congregation and revival swept across Lewis, like they, nothing that they'd ever seen before. People were coming from all over Scotland to go to Lewis, to their revival meetings. There was a famous uh, Duncan Campbell there, the famous minister in his day. He had bookings for the next year. They asked him to come to Lewis. He said, I can't come. And then the next day, every single one of his bookings cancelled. And he was free to go. So he went, and when he went, it was like adding fuel to the fire, as it were. Because the meetings then even got bigger, and people came from all over, and they would be praying until four o'clock in the morning from nine o'clock at night. They bust people in from uh, mainland Scotland, ferried them in, and there wasn't enough room in the churches. And when they went outside of the church on one occasion, Duncan remarked that there were over 600 people in the roadside praying and ministering to one another. What is common with all of those revival meetings? They were preceded by prayer. Not just prayer where there's a monologue of one person praying, but people were all praying together at the same time. 
They couldn't wait for the per next person to finish their prayers. They were bursting and they had to start praying themselves. Sometimes the prayer meeting would be so loud that it would be described like rolling thunder. And then it would go quiet and there might be like a pocket or two of people praying, a pocket over there of people praying. And then the Holy Spirit would wave across it again and it would lift up. What's common with all revival meetings or where revival happens is that there is deep, fervent prayer beforehand. Not five minute prayer, not arrow prayers, but hours of prayer, dedication to prayer. We want things to change and we need things to change here in Lewis, in our society. Are you serious that you want things to change? You want things to change in your life. Are you serious about wanting things to change? If you are, you need to start praying. Now, the ladies have put us men to shame. They've started their monthly prayer meeting. And when the ladies started their monthly prayer meeting, they all started turning up. When we started our monthly prayer meeting as men, the first one was okay, seven of us, and the next one nobody came. You want something to change in your life, guys. You've got to start praying seriously. It's a challenge. It's a challenge for me as well. It's not just for you. Don't think I'm picking on you. God has given us this privilege of his manifold wisdom. And are we really going to treat it so lightly as though it's insignificant? The questions are on the table. They come up on the screen as well. Can you pray, Lord, bend me? Can you pray, are my hands clean, is my heart pure? We can't have a service without praying at the end of it, so we'll do that as well. But just take five minutes and discuss what that means amongst you.